Happy Sabbath, everyone. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord? I know I am. Um, how many of you here know somebody that do not know how to read? We're not talking about somebody that reads bad, but we're talking somebody that do not know A, B, C. Okay, only a few people. Growing, growing up in k we know lots of them. Because back in the days, there was no education system in my grandmother's day in k So a neighbor may help somebody else or something like that. So I just received a call this morning from somebody in Portugal. And she started to talk to me about uh, coronavirus. And then she told me, I know it's in the Bible that these things would happen. And she's one of those that do not know how to read. So she says, I don't know how to read, but I know it's in there. I heard it when I used to go to church. And this is at least 30 to 40 years ago that she used to go to church. And she is still remembering those things that she heard. So my encouragement is keep preaching the gospel in season, out of season, to the blinds, to those that cannot read. God is doing marvelous work. So today here, we're continuing with the Revelation of Jesus Christ seminar because God wants to reveal himself to everyone. So welcome for you that are here and welcome to everyone that is online. We are very happy and glad to have you back uh, for our seminar, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, as we come to you live from Watchtower Hills uh, College Campus. And this has been really an amazing uh, very, very amazing seminar in the book of Revelation. It feels like we don't want it to end. Do you guys have that same feeling or am I alone in this one? It feels like we should continue. And the Lord will continue by you continue to check those things that you have heard. Take them through the Bible. Today, our speaker is Joshua Holly, and the topic is Bowing to the Beast. Very timely topic. Stick around, please, as you hear it. But before that, we're going to have an amazing song by the Martin family. Thank you so much. Prepare your heart as you listen uh, to the music, and the Lord has a message for his people today. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God for the Sabbath day. And you see the message title today is Bowing to the Beast. And it's going to be a very interesting study. And before we get into it, I'm just going to ask for you to bow your head and pray with me. Lord, um, Father, again, here it is, um, your sacred hour. And Father, I just want to pray, Lord, that if there's anything in my life or anything in my heart, Father, 
that you would take it from me now. Forgive me, Lord. I pray that nothing would hinder your message today, Father. I pray for your Holy Spirit, your holy angels to be here, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to us and reveal to us Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the Antichrist, friends, that's what we're going to be looking at today and what we're going to be studying. Um, But before we get into this study, friends, I want us to notice something. I want us to notice the title of the book Revelation, the title to this seminar. I want us to notice what the title is. What does it say? It's the revelation of what? Of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. So the book of Revelation is a book that is to reveal Jesus to us. It's not just a book simply about Bible prophecy. It is a book that reveals Jesus and reveals who he truly is. Did you know that? You know, let me ask you, if you want to get to know somebody, what's something that you need to know about them? And it starts with a T. You need to know their what? You need to know their testimony, right? If you want to get to know somebody, you get to, you hear their testimony, and then you really begin to know who that person is. Is that not true? I want us to notice what the Bible says in Revelation 19, verse 10. The Bible says, for the testimony of Jesus is what? So you know what that means, friends? That means that you, it is the voice of Jesus that speaks to us through all the prophecies in the Old Testament and in Revelation. It is the life of Jesus, friends. The Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So if you want to know Jesus, if you want to know about Jesus, you know what the Bible's saying right here? You need to study prophecy. Did you know that? That's what the Bible is telling us tonight for today, friends, that we need to study prophecy to get to know who Jesus is. And that's what I want to do, friends. I want to learn about Jesus, and I want to do the best I can to present Jesus to you today, friends. And before we get into this topic of the Antichrist, I want us to notice something. I want us to go back to a story found in Daniel chapter 3. It is an amazing story that parallels very clearly to the Antichrist in Revelation 13. Does everybody know the story of um, Daniel chapter 3 of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar had um, built this mighty image that was made of all gold. And he made a law in the kingdom of Babylon. He made it a law, passed a law that at a certain time, you had to bow down and worship this image. And that's really interesting, because, you know, that's the second story that we've learned about in Daniel, to where a law was passed that caused people to have to violate the Ten Commandment law. I wonder if God is trying to tell us something, if God's trying to speak to us through that. But in this story, friends, of Daniel chapter 3, when this law was passed, notice what it says in verse 6. It says, And whosoever falleth not down, And worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And when the music played and all bowed down to worship, there was three that didn't, friends. And that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew the commandments of God. They knew the second commandment said, you shall not make an image and you shall not bow down and worship the image. And so they would not do it, friends. And so Nebuchadnezzar called them, he was furious, and he called those three Hebrew boys and said, maybe you didn't understand. Maybe you didn't hear what I said. I'm going to give you one more chance to bow down and violate God's law to keep my law. But notice what the Bible says in verse 18. It says, Be it known unto thee, king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the, the golden image which thou hast set up. And in verse 21 it says, And these three men, these men, then these men were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. But notice verse 28 right here. Nebuchadnezzar, then Nebuchadnezzar the king said, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? In verse 25, how is it I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You know, as these men had stood up for God, the lesson we can learn right here, friends, as we stand up for God in the end of times, that God is our protector. And God will be with us. God will be our defender, friends. But God is trying to tell us something in this story right here, friends. So the first question is, how does our story in Daniel chapter 3, how does our story in Daniel chapter 3 relate to Revelation? And what I want us to do real quick, if you have your Bibles, I'd like everybody to grab your Bibles. Because we're going to read real quick. We're going to read Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to notice that we don't see some parallels. 
Revelation chapter 13. Does everybody have, is everybody there? All right, let's read. The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat in great authority. That sounds very similar to Daniel chapter 7 right there. And in verse 3 it says, And I saw one of his heads as they were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given, over, given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man hear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, should both speak, That they should make an image of the beast which had the sword and lived. They should give life unto the beast, to the image which did speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For is the number of a man, and his number is three is six hundred three score, and six. So that sounds that sounds. There's a lot of different likenesses to Daniel chapter three. Do y'all see that? How there's going to be an image set up in the end of days, and that all are going to be commanded to worship that image. And if you don't worship, you're gonna be killed. Does everybody see that? You know, I'll just tell you right now, friends, that I believe through abundance of evidence that that first beast is the Roman papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, through evidence, friends. The Bible gives us an abundance of evidence, and we're going to look at some of that thing. I believe the second beast is represented by the United States of America. And that's another subject right there, friends. But today, today what we want to do is we want to identify the first beast. So the first question is, how does our story in Daniel 3 relate to Revelation 13? The Bible says, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And what I want us to notice too, friends, is in Revelation chapter 13, we see this beast rising up. But in Revelation chapter 14, we see an amazing message that is to go out to all the world saying not to worship the, Im- the beast and not to worship his image. And it's depicted by three angels. We call it a three angels message in our church. And it is an amazing prophecy, friends. And I want us to look at that real quick. In Revelation 14, in verse 6, it says, for there was an angel flying to the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth. And in verse 7, it says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. You know, that's a really interesting quote right there, because that sounds very familiar to Exodus 20, the fourth commandment. You know, as we've seen two different stories in Daniel chapter 2, of how the land had passed a law to violate God's Ten Commandment law. It's almost as if in Revelation 14, when it talks about an image being built up, that there, there, that there is a calling back to keep God's true Sabbath. Because that's a direct quote from Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, friends. 
And in verse 8, it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. But what I want us to look at, what I want us to look at, friends, is this third angel's message. It's an amazing message, friends. A message of hope, a message of mercy, and a message of God's love, a message of God's protecting care for his children. A beautiful message, friends. And I want us to look at this message right here. And the third, this is found in Revelation 14, verse 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You know, brother, this is not meant to be a fearful message right here. This is a beautiful message of God's love for his people. You know, as God is witnessing this world, friends, in witnessing the deception and the abuse that is taking place on his children, friends, God is fed up with it. You know, God wants us to know today that God is a God of love. And God loves the whole world, friends, but as he is witnessing before he comes back, a people that is not only abusing his children, but is trying to kill his children. You know, I don't know if some of you maybe haven't grown up with a father. Maybe you don't know what it's like to have the protection of a protective father. You know, this message is for all, but it's especially for you. If you've never had that protective father, God wants you to know today that he's your protector and he loves you. And as he witnesses the abuse that's going on in the world today, friends, God wants you to know that I'm coming. And when I come, vengeance is mine. Because God is fed up, friends. God is angry when he comes back. Have you ever wondered why God is angry? Now you should know, friends, because as he sees his children being harmed and abused, God wants us to know, friends, that he loves his children. And friends, as we see this warning, not to worship the beast, not to worship his image, and not to receive his mark. We see a most solemn, fearful punishment to those that do worship the beast and worship his image. Do you think God would not make it clear to us? Our loving Father, who loves us, do you think God would not reveal to us very clearly who this beast is? The book says it's a revelation of Jesus. The book is a revelation of who Jesus Christ is, friends. And even in this fearful third angel's message, we can see the love of Jesus speaking about the Antichrist, the beautiful subjects of our church, the beautiful doctrines. We can still see the love of Jesus and the love of a father, friends. And I pray that you see that today, friends, that by studying prophecy, by studying this topic, by understanding who the beast is, friends, that eternity as it is at stake, friends. And God wants us to know so the second question is, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? In Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, it says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Daniel 7, 23 says, The fourth beast shall, shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So the next question is, how does the Bible identify this beast in Revelation chapter 13? The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. You know what's really interesting? Is this sounds very similar to Daniel chapter 7. When Daniel had a vision, he saw a lion, then he saw a bear, then he saw a leopard and a great dragon, right? You know, as Daniel was looking forward, but now as John is looking backwards in times, he sees the exact same thing, but he sees it the other way around. He sees the leopard, the bear, and then the lion. That's really interesting, isn't it? So friends, the Bible gives us 10 clues, 10 very clear clues on who this beast power is, friends, and God wants us to know, friends, and it is important that we know, friends, because the Bible tells us, friends, that the truth will do what? 
make you free, friends. And God wants to set us all free today, friends. So what we want to do is look at these points today. So there's 10 points. Point one, it says that it rises up out of the sea. That's in verse one. It receives its power, seat, and authority from the dragon. That's verse two. It becomes a worldwide power. That's in verse three. And seven is guilty of blasphemy. That's one, five, and six. It rules for 42 prophetic months. It receives a deadly wound that heals. That's verse three. A religious power that receives worship. That's verse four and eight. It persecutes God's saints. That's verse 7, and has the mysterious number 666, is led by one supreme man. And again, friends, there is only one power in all of the world. If you look at history, it is very clear, friends, of who this power is. But we're going to go over them today, friends. Question number four, this beast arises out of the sea, and what does the sea or water symbolize? The Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 15, the waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So we see right there, friends, that the papacy arose out of, from the center of civilization. It didn't just rise up out of nowhere, friends. It says that it would arise up amongst a multitude of nations, a multitude of people. Do you see that? So that's the first thing, friends. So question number five, who gives the beast his power and his position? In Revelation 13, 2, it says, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. But who is the dragon? It's the devil. But you know, if you go to Revelation chapter 12, it's really interesting because there's a prophecy of this woman bringing forth a male child to save, the, to save their people, and it's a prophecy of Jesus. And it says the devil, the dragon, was trying to devour the male child. And who, who was the devil working through at that time? Through Rome. And when you look at Daniel chapter 7, it talks about this beast with, with, with ten horns, and it's talking about Rome, friends. So it's not only talking about this, this, this beast power receiving its power from the devil, it's saying that it receives its power and authority from Rome, which is really interesting. So it says, the dragon gave power, seat, and authority. And I want us to notice um, a quote right here. It's found in Abbott's Roman history. It says, the transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. And at the time, one might have predicted her speedy decline, but the development of the church and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome or the pope gave her a new lease on life and made her again the capital, this time the religious capital of the civilized world. So as Rome was declining, as Rome was crumbling and becoming nothing, it, it, it gave its power to the church. Do y'all see that? And that's what happened in history. When you go and study history, you see the decline of Rome as Rome was crumbling and becoming nothing. As it was being overtaken by barbaric tribes, the Roman Catholic Church was gaining power. And it got its power from Rome. That's history right there. Another quote real quick. It says, To the succession of the Caesar came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. That's from the professor of history, University of Rome. So the beast receives power, seat, and authority from Rome. So it fits that point very clearly. So number six is how far reaching is the influence of the beast? Revelation 13 verse three says, and all the world wandered after the beast. In verse seven, it says, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And you know, nobody can deny right now, friends, the largest Christian denomination in the world today is what? Catholicism, with over a billion members. You know, it's interesting because the word Catholic actually means universal. That's what the word means. It is a gigantic, you are, when people, it's so big because people are born into Catholicism. And you know, I just want to say that this message is not meant to attack Catholics. It's not meant to, God has faithful people in all different churches, friends, but it is a message to attack the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church because it's not biblical, friends. And you know, all through the Bible, you see God sends warnings to his people. His people have always messed up, have always gone astray, have always decided to worship at the dictates of their own heart. And God always sends his people a message of warning. So this message is for all the world, and it's for the Roman Catholics too. God loves them too. And God is rebuking them for their teaching, friends. So question number seven is, what comes out of the mouth of the beast? The Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 6, And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. So somebody that is claiming to be God, the Bible says that that is blasphemy. In John 10, verse 33, it says, The Jews answered him, speaking to Jesus, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. I want you to notice this quote right here. This quote right here is from Pope Leo VIII. He said, We hold upon this place, upon this earth, the place of God Almighty. You know, about 10 years ago, actually it was like 11 years ago, I was watching a series similar to this. And I remember the man that was, well, I started preaching and I was kind of listening to him and I heard him start talking about the Antichrist and there was a picture of the Pope on the screen and it just caught my attention. Like I never in my life could have ever thought, you know, I've heard about the Antichrist, I have heard about the beast all my life, but I never thought that it was something that was here and now today. Never thought that, friends. Never knew the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Never knew the things that they did. And you know, they don't teach that in the school. They don't teach the history of the Roman Catholic Church. And I wonder why. I wonder why. The Bible says in Luke 5, verse 21, it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Notice this quote right here again. It says, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgments of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the, the, sentence of the priest proceeds and God subscribes to it. This is from the Catholic Church themselves, friends. They claim to have the power to forgive sins, that they are God on earth. And I was amazed when I learned that there's actually... A, actually a system in the world today that claims to be God on earth. It's amazing. Question number eight is, how long would the first beast rule? So we see that it fits that next point, that sure, they do speak blasphemy against God. We see it fits that point very clearly. But how long would this first beast rule? The Bible says in Revelation 13, 5, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. 40 and two months. So that's what? By the Jewish calendar, that's 30 days times, times 42. So what is that? 1,260 days, right? 1,260 days, but it's interesting. Because what's interesting is, does it really mean days? Or does it mean something different? Because Ezekiel chapter 4, notice what it says in Ezekiel chapter 4. It says, I have given you a day for a year. So it's almost as if this beast power would rule for 1,260 years. Not days. And that makes sense, because if you look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church, here's another quote. It says, the legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 530 AD when there, were, when there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian, making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrines, and the corrector of heretics. Another quote. Um, Vigilius ascended the papal chair in AD 538 under the military protection of Belisarius. So the Bible says right here that this beast power would come into power and that it would rule for 1260 years. And this is so amazing to me, friends, because as we look at history, we see that the Roman Catholic Church, they rose into power at 530 AD, friends. But notice this, friends, is what happens to the beast after the 42 months. In Revelation 13:3, it says, and I saw one of his heads as they were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So according to the Bible, friends, this beast power would rise up around 538 AD, and it would rule the entire world for 1260 years. And it says it would come to an end if it, rose, if it, if it ruled the earth for 1260 years, beginning at 530 AD. That means it would come to an end in 1798, Right? And it's so amazing as you look at history, friends, and you notice the French Revolution, that's exactly what happened. In 1798, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. So the, Rome, the Roman papacy was completely annihilated as a ruling power in 1798, just like the Bible says. The Bible says, friends, that that's how long it ruled. And it's amazing. And you know, notice this right here, too, in Revelation 13:10. It says, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must 
must be killed with the sword. And that's exactly what happened. As this Roman church was slaughtering people, murdering millions and millions of Christians for over a thousand years, the Bible says he that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. And he that leadeth into captivity will go into captivity. And whenever um, the general took the, pope, he took the pope captive and he died in exile, friends, that's exactly what happened to the pope in 1798. I don't know about you, friends, that's amazing to me. It's amazing to me to see the truth of the Bible fulfilled. Studying history, looking at these things, friends, to know that we can trust the Bible, friends. But what else does it say? It says that after this 1260 years, that what the, the deadly wound that this beast received would be what? Would be healed. So in 1798, there was no, the Roman Catholic Church was no more, there was no more power in that Roman Catholic Church, but it said that that beast's power, that that, that wound would be healed. That's what the Bible says, right? And in 1929, that's exactly what happened, friends. That the Roman papacy was again established as its own independent country. I never knew that the Roman papacy was an actual country. That it was its own independent nation. You know, never, never knew that, friends. And although it was abolished for a short time in 1929, friends, that deadly wound began to get healed. And I want us to notice something right here. This is so powerful. Because I want you to notice the wording to this newspaper article. Maybe many of you have seen it before, but it's from the San Francisco Chronicles. And it's just, um, notice the wording. God is so amazing the way he reveals things to us because he doesn't want us to wonder. If God has given such a warning of punishment to those who worship the beast, he wants us to know who this beast is, friends. And notice the wording right here. It says, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the what? Healing the wound. Healing the wound, friends. That's exactly what began to happen in 1929, and it's still healing today, friends. You know, it's almost as if every week you see the, you see the Pope in the news. You see something that he's doing, traveling the world, make, make, making peace with everybody. Like, you see that the Pope is taking the world by storm today, friends. So the question number 10 is, is the beast a government or a religious power? Is it a government or a religious power? In Revelation 13, 15, it says, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So we see, so we see here, friends, it is about worship. And it's always been about worship. When you study the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you are always seeing God's people departing from the truth but still worshiping God to the dicta at the dictates of their own heart. It's always about worship, friends. And it's about worship now. It's about worship at the end of times too, friends. And we see the papacy fits that very well. So next question, friends, question 11, is what does the beast do to the saints? What does the beast do to the saints? The Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The Bible tells us, friends, that his people are going to be overcome. And as we look back at the pages of history, the pages of history that they don't teach you in school, it's almost as if there's a cover-up. We see the blood-stained path that the Catholic Church has left all through the Dark Ages, murdering millions upon millions of faithful Christians, faithful Christians, if you believed in the true God and you wanted to follow the God with all your heart, friends, they would burn you at the stake. Burn you at the stake. And let me tell you something, friends. That's why that third angel's message is so serious. As God traces back all those times when his faithful people were slaughtered, God, when he comes back, friends, he's not happy. And I'm thankful for that, friends. I'm thankful to have a father that wants to protect us, a loving father, friends as he's witnessed all the bloodshed, notice this quote right here, that the church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. A competent knowledge of history, friends, tells you that they were slaughtering God's people for over a thousand years. So it fits that point perfectly, friends, as we are seeing clearly, friends, that the Roman church is clearly identified in Revelation 13. Do we all see that? I pray that God has given us eyes to see. I pray that we can see that, friends. See the truth, friends. 
So the next question that we have to look at is what is the mysterious number that identifies the beast? The Bible says in Revelation 13, verse 18, it says, here is wisdom. I want you to notice the words here too. Pay attention real quick. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a what? That's really interesting. Because how does a man have a number? It's almost saying that, 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 that this man, his name is a number. Do you see that? It's, notice the wording. Friends. So it's saying that this man of 666, that his name, that his name is 666. It says, he that has wisdom, wisdom and he that hath understanding, count the number of his name. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. And I found this very interesting as I was studying this that it says it was the number of a man. And I want us to notice the name of the Pope, his title, friends. This is from a book called Crossing Crossing the Threshold of Hope. It says, confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined as the vicar of Christ and is accepted as such by believers. It says the Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. What a bold, blasphemous statement that they make right there. But notice what it said his name was in his title. What did it say his name and title was right there? The vicar of of Jesus Christ. The vicar of Jesus Christ. So friends, the thing is, the the Pope has this crown that I guess is mysteriously gone missing that nobody can find anymore. And on the, po- on the Pope's crown is the interesting title. It says, the letters on the Pope's crown are these, Vicarious Philae Dei, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. And I want, us to no- want you to notice the screen right here. I know it's kind of dark, friends. But you know, in, in Latin, in, in Roman, the, num- the letters, like in English, our, our letters mean our letters. They don't, they don't have numbers to them. But it's not like that in Latin. They, they're equal to the Ro- Roman numerical value. So all the letters have a numerical value to it. And I don't know who the one, who's the one that came up with this, but I found it very interesting, friends, that when you take the Pope's name, the title of his name that's in his crown, and you add up all those numbers, it equals 666. That's really interesting. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I, I, I don't know. If that is exactly what it is, friends. I'll tell you that right now. I I don't know everything about Revelation, friends. But what I know is there is abundance of evidence to say that the Roman Catholic Church is 100% the beast. No doubt, friends. And it's really interesting that it says that 666 is the number of a man. So it is a name. That's what the Bible says. You can't argue with that. It says it is his name. And the title of the Pope, it couldn't just be a Pope's name. Because there's all kinds of different popes with different names. But you see that his title, who he claims to be, the Roman numerical value of that name equals 666. I think maybe God is trying to tell us something. What do you think? I think he is, friends. And you know, the last question, friends, we're fixing to come to a close, is why is it important that we know who the beast is? We learned it at the beginning, though, because the book of Revelation is what? The revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ, friends. I want you to look at the Bible different today, friends, that when you study prophecy, you're getting to know Jesus. If you want to get to know Jesus, you need to study all of his word and especially the prophecies, friends. Do you get that? Not just the gospels. Not just the gospels. Let me tell you, if all you study was the gospels, friends, you're never going to really know who Jesus was or who he is. And that's a bold statement, but it's the truth. Because the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. God is trying to reveal to us who Jesus is. Through prophecy, even the Antichrist beast, friends, we can see the love of Jesus in every message, friends. And why is it important that we know who the beast is? Why is it important? Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 15, verse 2. 
And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten, gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Why is this so important, friends? Because eternity is at stake. Who's the ones that are translated? Who's the ones that he saw in heaven right here? Who was in heaven? Those who had got the victory over the beast and over his image. Eternity is at stake, friends. It is important that we understand Bible prophecy, friends. If there's ever a time that we need to understand who Jesus is and understand the prophecies of the Bible, it is times like these that we need to understand what is going on in our world today, friends. Jesus is calling us to have a deeper understanding and a deeper knowledge of who he is, friends. And if there's ever a time, ever a time, that you need to study your Bible and learn more about Jesus and hear his testimony, friends, it's times like these. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. The anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, you a Bible in times like these. Oh, be not idle. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. This rock is Jesus, the only one, be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid. chorus here with us. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. I'm very sure. My anchor holds and grips the solid rock. My Like, it was like 11 years ago when I was watching a prophecy seminar just like this, and I told you a little bit about it, about it. And I remember as I heard these truths, I was amazed. I'd never known these truths. I, I read books like Left Behind series and watched all these movies with just nonsense in it, friends. And I was, amazing to, I was amazed to learn there was truth. Amazed to know that the Bible was true. 
And that's what, when I learned these truths, friends, you know what it caused me to do? To study the Bible, to study the Word of God, friends, from Genesis to Revelation to see whether all these things are true, friends, because you can't just take my word for it. You have to study them out, friends. And like the song says, if there's ever a time, it's times like these that we need to know our Bible, friends. And I tell you, as I began studying my Bible over 10 years ago, my life slowly began to change. I still struggled. I still fell. And that's okay. You know, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times but gets back up. It's okay if you fall. Just get back up and keep moving forward. I struggled for a long time, friends. A long time. But learning about Jesus in the Bible, learning about prophecies, friends, began, led me to study my Bible with a deep sincerity to learn truth, friends. And as I began learning truth, friends, and giving my life to Jesus, all my heart, my life began to change dramatically. Like amazing, I'm so amazed at what God can do and what he's able to do, friends. And all he's asking you to do is study my word. Study my word. Keep reading. That's what he wants to say to you. You want to ask God what you need to do with your life? You know what he's going to tell you? Keep reading. Read my Bible. Read my word. And let him change you, friends. How many of you would like to make that commitment today? To study God's word faithfully, friends. Not a quick glance every morning. Study the word of God and allow it to change you. Study the life of Jesus, which begins in, Re in Genesis and ends in Revelation. So would you like to do that today, friends? Make that commitment to study your Bible, friends. You want to kneel with me? Let's kneel. Father, we know the, you know, Lord, the struggles of life, Father. You see our daily trials, our daily struggles, Father, but you have given us hope in Jesus. And Father, you have given us hope in your word. And Lord, today, Father, I myself, Lord, along with my family and friends here today, we want to make a commitment, Lord, to search the deep things of God in your word. And Father, we pray that as we study your word, that you would draw close to us, Father, and enlighten our minds to eternity, Father, and what's really at stake, and give us power, Lord, over the beast, over his image, and over his mark. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, Lord, and we pray that this Sabbath day, Father, could be a blessing, Lord, and one where we could draw close to you. We pray that your presence would abide with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, friends, our last meeting is tonight. And we've seen that there, the beast has a mark, friends, and we need to know what that mark is. And it is just as an important of a message as the one I've shared with you today, friends. And at 5 o'clock, Mark Kennedy is going to be sharing with us about what that mark is. So please don't miss it. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.